My guest tonight often goes by the name Welshy. He is best known for his web series, Panda Q&A, his retrospective on the Saw movies, and in the Uncanny Valley, he did a wonderful documentary called The Dark Side of the Internet. Please welcome Matt Williams. How are you? I am very well. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for having me. Um, now, you technically are no longer with thatguywiththeglasses.com, so why am I talking to you? Because you realize I'm irreplaceable. And quite frankly, there's nobody better than me. I That's have had a lot of people sit in that chair and, and, and interview before, but none of them had a monkey. So there might be some truth. If more people brought monkeys, maybe these interviews would go better. Yeah, and quite frankly, everybody in life needs a monkey. Michael Jackson had one. That brings me to my next question. What's with the monkey? The monkey is... Oh, the uh, long version is that the very talented, very well-respected, my former boss, Rob Walker... Moment for him. Yes. He... What's the nice way to say this? Reprimand! Reprimanded me, uh, which is now a thing. Which is uh, one of the things... I've always found that uh, the good thing in life is that if you have something, you turn it into a gimmick. And Rob reprimanded me for something that Mr. Sad Panda had done, because clearly we look alike. You we look very, very we similar. We sound alike. Mm -hmm. We're from the same country, even though he's French and I'm Welsh. But yes. They sound very similar, though. Even um, the words French, Welsh, it's like, it's an easy mix. And Rob did, for some reason, um, meet Panda. Twice. And uh, reprimanded me for something he had done. Which, you know, I took like any mature person would do, you know, when that happens. So I named my monkey after Rob. And uh, ever since then, in my videos, Rob, who I look after very well, has been torn, hung, burnt, blown up, and strangled. So it's my way of sort of like showing how much I care and respect Rob Walker. Well, she, you're fired. Most of the time, I would say the answer went on too long, but seeing how it's coming around to totally defacing my brother, I'm going to let it go on a little longer. Uh, what else do you not like about Rob Walker? How about Rob Walker? Uh, well, I don't like the fact that during the Uncanny Valley uh, segments, he tried to turn it into something about some goddamn karma thing. What, what, what was that? What really what, what was uh, it, that? It, it confused me. I mean, if only I was there for the writing. I know. I've, I've read the comments. <sighs> Nobody liked him. People were just upset when Nash had to die with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And upset and cheerful that, that they were both he, gone. Yeah, that yeah. they've gone. Yeah. I mean, what, what was that? Well, honestly, what was that? I, I don't know. I still try to figure out what he is at times. He's an entity that I'm afraid to understand, but at the same time can't help but question. He does do an awesome Palpatine impression, though. He does do that very well. Uh, with all that said, <laughs> and obviously your love of video making, uh, what did get you involved with video making, and what is the attraction? Started off really much. You. Um, when you were doing um, your YouTube See, videos. I like this. You insult my brother, and then you but, talk about how great I am. Yes. This is a wonderful it's, interview. It's, I like how this is going. Be. It's got to be, because this is the man who's on the site. You got, your face is the site. You are the site. You run the site. You know, I, I read the internet. I hear what everyone says. Technically, other people run the site, but oh, I no, like no. that you think I run yes. the site. you run so the let's site. Go you make with all the decisions. Mm, yeah. But no, you started off with your YouTube um, videos, and when you got pulled, um, and then started uh, that guy with the glasses... I started making trailers to promote the new NCs because at the point it was just NCs you were doing. And then uh, Mike Michaud got in touch with me and asked me to make trailers for everybody else. And that was my sort of foray into the editing. And then Seth Panda got in touch with, originally it was Cole Guy who got in touch with me and asked me to edit for him. And then Panda got in touch with me and that's how Panda Q&A started. Because he'd written the first episode of Panda Q&A and I was just this disembodied voice off camera. And that was, again, my first appearance. And I was using, at the time, a very small digital camera. I didn't even have a, a camcorder. And that was my first appearance on camera, was in the Panda Q&As. And that was where I started writing. And that's where all that sort of came from. It was the uh, sort of introduction to writing shows, because Panda would write the bulk of it to begin with. And then I just added my own jokes. And then it became more of a collaboration, where we'd throw ideas at each other and then shape the whole thing around it. But the fun just came from it because it was like a hobby. It was just really fun. We'd been really creative, getting to work on your own time, getting to put out your own content. And there was nothing more free in that because you could say what you wanted. You could hone yourself and shape your own sort of sense of humor and put it all into this video. 
and I mean, it's the same as it, but uh, it's just, it was liberating to do it. A lot of people, including myself, have a hard time watching our older material, like when we're first starting out. Do you have that, or do you not really care as much? I don't watch my old stuff. There's a very few occasions I'll watch it, and it, that's usually to find something I've said, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler for continuity. I'm a stickler, so it's, if somebody will say, you know, well, you said this year, but you said this earlier, I, I, I'm a vague thing of, of continuity. So I'll, I'll look back if I think to myself, now I know I've referenced this before, but I want to make sure I... My, my sort of like maintains sort of like uh, how it all makes sense. Panda's the sort of one who uh, doesn't care about continuity at all. And if you've ever watched any of Panda's videos, you'll know he's just like throw everything at the, throw everything at the screen and see what sticks, um, which works for him. But that's, that's why again we we work well together with uh, the Panda Q and A thing because he comes up with the sort of madcap jokes. I'll come up with the sort of like to sort of shape it because we, we when we filmed um, Nerd Quest, which was with the Mike Jeffs uh, uh, horror film that we filmed last year. I was very much a thing about um, finding the sort of character identity, and so, so Mike had the whole script pretty much done. And then when we did a sort of a rewrite together, I sort of like tried to make things consistent between characters, so that every character was the, was their own character, and every character sort of like maintained a form of continuity and growth in the film. With the dark side of the internet that again aired with the Uncanny Valley, uh, you pretty much talk about sort of abuse online, whether it be verbal, whether it go even further than that. Do you think that because the internet is still, in the grand scheme of things, a, a very young uh, creation, that this will pass, or do you think it'll get worse? I think it'll get worse before it gets better, because um, what you're going to find is that, um, I mean, now, I, I don't know how it is here, but in the UK, it's there's a big crackdown now on um, our, our pedophilia. There's a big crackdown on it, because... I think in the last and, so, and uh, sort of bullying because in the last couple of months, <laughs> pedophilia and bullying yeah. they just so hand in hand. I guess yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's become a big thing and so you know the government are getting involved and everything and it's the sort of thing that you know they crank into it's a typical sort of government movie you crank down on something really sort of heavy. But I think it'll get worse, but it will get better because it'll become that sort of thing where it's inevitably going to be policed. Uh, because it happens, anything new comes out, you sort of like it's ignored to begin with, and suddenly it's so popular. Then sort of the media and everything will turn their attention to it, and then there'll be that sort of leveling out phase where it'll still happen. It'll always happen because it happens in real life, but it won't be as sort of mainstream as it is now. But yeah, worse before it gets better, which is a, sh a shame. But it's sort of like it's inevitable because it happens with everything. Uh. What is the difference, in your opinion, between your trolling and other people's trolling? Because I noticed that, like, when people tend to bring stuff up to you or something they don't like, or they try to troll you, you'll troll them back. Or you have sort of this ongoing joke with producers, if you don't like something or you feel there's a joke, even if it seems kind of not appropriate, you'll still go for it. So when you see someone else trying to troll someone uh, or try to get their goat versus when you try to get their goat. What is the difference? I say the main difference is a lot of the times with the, with the guys, with the producers, I'll check first. I will check. I, I, I never, I never want to sort of, and I'll never ever do something personal or something I will, I will, I will, I will never do that. It's just like you, if you ever see me troll a producer, it's never going to be about the, the person. It's about the producer. It's about the character that they have. I, I, I could never, ever do something personal. Me and Panda have got that unwritten rule where we just troll each other to the hills because, you know, we're really good friends and we know, we know, you know, it's never, it's, it's never serious. When it comes to people in the comments, I'll generally do it if, because it, it just rolls off me. I, I you know, I, it, does, it doesn't bother me when people say, you need a thick skin to do this sort of thing. And it, that doesn't bother me. I don't like it when friends uh, I have, because uh, I'm, I'm close with people like Film Brain, uh, Maddie Burke, like Alison. When they get attacked, I don't like it, and I will, I'll do, I'll do it for more out of protection, protectiveness. But I'll never, it'll never be like a campaign. It'll be a, a comment, and that's it. I sort of forget about it. I, I, I move on, and it doesn't sort of bother me again. And I think the difference with sort of like the trolls you get online is that they carry on. They'll go to forums, they'll go to chat rooms, they'll go to videos, they'll open up six or seven accounts, and they will just like religiously go after this one person. And just like, well, why? You know, I, I will sort of like make my stand to sort of say this, this is my friend, or if it's about me personally, I'll throw it into a video and make a joke about it, but I'll never, you know, name the person, and then I'll move on, and it, it won't bother me. And generally, a lot of the time is the person who did the trolling 
likes the fact that I reference them, and they then forget about it. Because they sort of think to themselves, oh, he's got a sense of humour, it doesn't bother him, and that's it. So it's, it's almost like the best way to sort of acknowledge it sometimes, because I think uh, Brad has does this sort of, he's done it in the past, Balin has done it in the past as well. They just sort of like acknowledge the sort of comment, and the comments will stop. And I found that a lot. And um, I've always tried to sort of, especially with Matty, because he's young, and I mean, I've uh, been speaking to him before he started Bad Movie Beatdown, and that was one of the things I always sort of said to him is, don't let it get to you. And I say that to him because he is young, and I've always got to remind myself of that. He's, I mean, he's 10 years younger than me, which makes me feel old. He seems to have a really good sense of humor about that stuff. Like, every time I put him in a role where he's going to sort of be, like, the kiss-up or, again, like, the little kid or something like that, like, he never oh, has he a problem it. with he it. It, it, yeah. it seems like he really relishes yeah, that stuff he loves and it. just playing sort of a different He role. loves playing different, yeah, that's, that's one thing. Because I remember a lot of the people said when they saw Kick Ass, yeah, he's nothing like in his videos. And he loved that. He loved that he got to play against type. Because in his videos, he's very sort of well-spoken, he's articulate, he's analytical, he's all those sort of things, and then in the Kikastu especially, he was just this, you know, over-excitable little boy and sort of stuff, and you know, you never, get to, you never get to see that in his videos. And he enjoyed that, he enjoyed doing something different. Um, do you ever find, it seems like whenever you bring something up, like you said, when you bring something up with, with a troll or acknowledge a comment, they seem to stop when you do it. Why do you think it is that when you can bring it up, they stop it with other people, it, it'll continue and it'll keep going. What do you do different that other people should maybe pick up on? I think I'm ironic about a lot of the things that happen. I'm, it's, uh, it's a sort of thing where, I think it's a very British trait, the sarcasm sort of thing for, you know, and the irony sort of thing. It's, if you've ever watched Space, you've ever watched, if you've ever watched Space, any sort of UK show, Red Dwarf, sort of stuff there, the British have a very, very strong sense of irony and a lot of people don't get it. Um, which is which is a shame because um, some, cause, I mean I've read comments where people don't know if I'm being serious or not. I mean the whole thing with Dark Side of the Internet. I've read comments where people didn't know if it was serious. I've got a disclaimer at the beginning of the video saying it's serious, saying it could you know this could this could offend certain people and it could upset certain people, but because of the reputation I have, people were still wondering if it was serious and it's that's that's a shame but at the same time I, my own fault because I kind of built up that that character, I guess you could say, of someone who you can never really tell if I'm being serious or not. Um, which is a shame, but I, 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 it's a character I live with now. Are you being serious now? Maybe. The monkey is throwing me for a loop, because it sounds like you're saying serious stuff, but then I just see that monkey looking at his crotch, and I don't know what I'm looking at or experiencing. You saw me on the charity me. drive last night. He was around my neck all night. It was very scary. And we did things to that monkey that, thank God he can't talk, because if he could, we would all be arrested. Yes, and the scotch tape on his arms and mm. his legs say a lot about what goes on behind closed doors. And we will just leave it at that. Um... In your opinion, is there a line that you shouldn't cross, whether it comes to trolling or, or fighting trolling uh, or, or any, anything online? Well, what is the line that you feel you should not cross, if there even is one? Family. That's when it's, it's just, um, if you're going to troll someone about the character they play or something they've said, fair enough, because you've said it. But then when people start to sort of comment on your family or people in your lives, girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, wives, and sort of stuff like that, children, if you've got kids, oh no, that's, you know, you don't, you keep it, you keep it to the character. And that's why, as I said, I've never ever gone um, as far as uh, commenting on people's personal lives. Oh, it's like when I, when I make fun of Rob Walker, I'm making fun of Rob Walker, the character that is in your videos and that uh, I've sort of put into my videos now. I've never made fun of Rob Walker, the man, or, Rob, or, or Rob's family. Or stuff like that because that's, that's personal there's, there's the on-camera life and then there's the non-camera life and the on-camera life is the sort of you know that's the show away from that that's personal that's nothing that's you know and that, that's when it goes too far and that's you do see that you see people in the comments they'll insult mothers fathers i'm just thinking no oh, it's too much too much it's just like we put ourselves on on the internet we're opening ourselves straight up to some form of criticism or some form of some form of trolling but that's us, and come at us, sort of stuff like that. But then when it's threats, 
you know, when you get threats and death threats. And I've had death threats. I've had death threats for people thinking I'm you from the YouTube channel. I still get nice. them. And uh, I, I, I have several. I should just make a folder of like how many death threats and I will find you and yeah. stuff are in there because of something either they didn't like or they think I'm the epitome of evil or something yeah. like that. I mean, and as you said, it's just something you have to know going in. Like this is just going to be a part of it, and you shouldn't be afraid of it. No. They, from what I found, actually, this is something I'm curious to ask you too. Do you find that may may the people that do the trolling and make these threats are usually cowards usually usually i mean there was a, a situation where um i'm not gonna i, I won't name names because i can't remember it but um there was somebody who was trolling a member of the a, a producer on the site and i wrote one comment to this to this person publicly you know so everyone could see and he accused me of trolling him and all I said was, you know, it was nothing trolling wise. It was just simply, why have you got multiple accounts? Because it was obvious it was this person with multiple accounts. And then mm -hmm. he accused me of trolling him. And everybody jumped then. It was just like, you know, uh, you know, pot kettle black and sort of stuff like that. And he disappeared. He disappeared after that. I'm just like, you know, if you confront, it's, it's the same sort of thing with bullying sometimes. It's, you know, you get, you confront them and they stop. And it's generally cowards to do it. Now, something, you know the phrase, of course you heard, don't feed the trolls. Your approach seems to be very different. You, not necessarily that you feed, but you confront. And with you, that seems to work. Uh, what, again, why does it work for you and not necessarily for others when they try to attack back? Is it just the pure irony? Because it sounds like you're being very straightforward with that. I, I think it's the, I think it's directness as well. Because I think Brad goes through the same. Uh, Fail goes through the same. Failus, um, they'll go through the same. It's it's the sort of, it's the sort of confrontational, but not not an aggressive form of confrontation. It's almost like this, again, this sort of like ironic pointing out what this person is saying and doing it in a way that sort of just, just, just like deflates the logic of it. It's just like, you know, they can then look at it and go, oh, yeah, that is, that, that oh, right, oh, yeah. And in the, almost like they, they get that little sort of lift out of it because they, they've got that lift of being referenced. You know, even though you don't name them, they know you're talking to them. And they kind of like that, you know, sort of thing. But then you end it. It's done. Do, do, do you feel it's that, I mean, everyone always says, oh, they're looking for attention. And it's, most of the time, it seems like that's it, even if they're not aware of it. And even if it is negative attention, because sadly, negative attention is faster to get than positive attention. Yeah. So you feel, even if you just acknowledge the negative attention without necessarily feeding into it more, that usually helps a great deal yeah well i mean you know the whole sort of, sort of thing with a lot of the reviews we do and you know the negative things are always better you know because um, people love to see you struggle they love to see you sort of um fight this sort of thing and when you throw in a negative comment about yourself and you can turn it into something funny that's good that's that's you no know, that's something that's um, that's something that you could, that, that makes you laugh as well I mean, I've had a, a sort of a, a running sort of feud, if you want to call it, with the Blockbuster Buster character because of a film he disliked. And people, again, were, weren't sure if I was re being serious or not about it. And I had him appear in one of my videos in a cameo, um, which was probably one of the most famous, I must say famous, but the funniest cameos I've ever included because it was so unexpected. And people loved that. And uh, I, just, I, I know, I love sort of, I love sort of like confusing people. And, you know, they'll, oh, I thought that, they didn't like each other and so you'll see it in the comments and I, I always read those comments and get a little smile myself because it's just like you sort of you trick people into thinking it and the first time I went to MAGFest was the funniest for me because people were coming up to me and telling me how nice I was and I was like really and then I actually went back and watched a couple of my videos and I was like oh yeah I'm not really nice on camera <laughs> Just a different personality. Comes yeah, out. it's just uh, you, you, you sort of like become this sort of cynical sort of like sort of person. I realized then, you know, oh, I might as well run with that. And then when I started doing the second sort of like year of my videos, I ran with the whole thing of being quite mean and cynical. And that's when the abuse of the monkey really started. <laughs> Very nice. Um, something I I always find fascinating when I see with people, and again, you, I'm sure you've come across this. Do you feel there is a limit to how much you can live online as opposed to how much you can live your life sort of in the real world, in the physical world. Uh, if there is a limit, what is it and why? I think there are some, well, there are, I mean, you've seen it, there are a lot of people who live their whole lives online. And I, I, I know I, you need that balance. You need that sort of, 
because it, it's unhealthy, you know, this sort of thing. It, it, it will be unhealthy for you to just stay, you know, online. I think I could talk about it in a dark side as well, how people sort of become so, because you create a persona for yourself when you're sort of hidden. Um, not just, you know, on camera, sort of like with a character, but sometimes when you're just in chat rooms or you're talking to somebody who you never really sort of see. And you need that sort of physical interaction with people on the out, in the outside world. You need to go out, you need friends in the real world. And one of the things you sort of see, you've, you've seen it with producers, when they talk about it as well, they struggle sometimes sort of like to make that connection with people in the real world. And you need that because you don't want to get lost in the sort of character or person you have behind the camera or behind the computer screen. Because that is, uh, now that can be dangerous in a sort of way because you, you get lost in that. And then when it comes to actually, because you're going to have to go out at some point, you're going to have to interact with people at some point. And if you haven't really honed those sort of skills, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really sort of put stand you in bad stead with a lot of people and you're going to have trouble making friends and all that sort of thing like that. And this isn't just video producers. This is no, this people is, this that is, go yeah. on forums and just live a very odd this is, life. Yeah, this is, this is like you know, people who do um, online video, you know, online video games and stuff like the MMO, MMOs and you know, Warcraft. But this is then people who just like spend, you know, because they're so, sometimes they are so... Uh, worried, um, you know, some of the stuff that's maybe gone on in their lives that they, they will go to forums to sort of talk about their problems, but then that's it. They stay there. They don't try and come out into the real world. And eventually you have to. Eventually you have to because, you know, you can't live online forever. You know, eventually you've got to go out into the real world. Eventually you've got to interact with real people. And that helps your confidence more than anything. Talking to people online is one thing. But really helping your confidence, and that's you know, so say with me, I've got the, I've got the, I've got the divide of having a real job, uh, as well as the online hobby. I've got friends online, who I'm really close with, and I care about. I've got friends in you know my real life, who I class as like my closest friends, almost like, love like uh, brothers and sisters. And you've got that, so you can do one thing and you can do the other, and that is a, you know that, that's the sort of balance that um, I know a lot of people do have, and you need it. You you do need it. Um. Now, what exactly, especially from someone who is not a fan of it, what is your fascination with the Saw movies? Why does that have a hold on you? If anything, it's because it's so personal to me, um, based on my journey while they were coming out. I'm always, because at the point, you've got to remember when, when the first Saw came out, torture porn wasn't really a phrase. And, and people always say, oh, Saw is just torture porn. I don't know, The Passion did it pretty well. <laughs> Oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> I love that. But um, the first Saw is certainly not torture porn because they didn't have a budget for it. The only was, was Saw 3 is when it started to become the sort of torture porn sort of thing with the sort of like twisted bodies and sort of stuff because they had the budget. But Saw, from a sort of uh, production standpoint, you're talking seven films in seven years, which is pretty impressive. It created a character in Jigsaw who, primarily thanks to Tobin Bell and his input, became so iconic. Um, you know, he's, he's a serial killer who doesn't actually kill. Um, and Tobin put a lot of, and Tobin himself put a lot of sort of thought into the sort of manifestations and thinking of the character. And he is a fascinating character, which is why even after he died, spoilers, he, uh, they kept him in. They kept him, they kept bringing him in and tried to feed him into the universe. But for me personally, the whole thing about Saw was from Saw 1 to Saw 7, I graduated university I went around the world. I traveled. I took a year out and traveled. So between Saw 3 and Saw 4, I went around the world on my own and just traveled. It became the tradition of um, me and my friend going to see it every Halloween. And very personal things that have happened um, where um, my dog, who we had bought uh, at a, quite a lot, and again, I talk about how sort of um, it touches on things like self harm and sort of stuff which is handled very well. It's not that sort of, um, you know, graphic sort of self-harm. It's, it's a very delicate issue, which is handled really well. I touch on that, because um, obviously I've gone through some bad things in my life. And um, the day I saw Saw 6 was the day my dog, we put my dog to sleep. And again, that was like saying goodbye to my childhood in a sort of way. It was like, you know, I went through all this sort of stuff while this series was going on. It's like I talk about Scream, and Scream was my introduction to the internet. I joined my first forum ever online for Scream. And that's why Scream is so important to me because it's that sort of side of the uh, internet for me. So it's like very, very personal to me because of the, what I was going through in my life during that seven years. I essentially grew up during those seven years, said goodbye to sort of uh, teens and, and became a young adult. And that's why that is so, is so personal to me. 
And I love looking at the sort of intricacies and sort of, of the story because it is convoluted and it is crazy, but there is a story there and they've woven it so well that if you look at Source 1 to 6, Source 7, but if you look at Source 1 to 6, there is a story there and it's very, very well told for what, they, you know, for what you'd expect from a horror film, um, which is classed as torture porn and pff, no, forget about it. The story is what brought people back. And that's what a lot of people love. Because if you go to, the, um, if, at the time, if you went to sort of forums and everything, everyone was talking about things. Because they'd throw in little things that they'd pay off, sometimes in three or four films later. And you know, there's this thing, they were fans, and they would visit the fan forums to sort of see what people liked. And I think that was one of the things about the films that was really cool as well, was the producers, the directors, they were all young guys all sort of like up onto the whole internet sort of thing with forums and uh, chat rooms and everything. And they go and talk to the fans. They go and you know, interact with all these people and the fact it gave the fans that sort of sense of we're in this as well. So it's a small, you know, cult-like thing for Saw, but it's just, it just a really sort of like cool little franchise to be involved with. Yeah, wonderful. Um, now that you are done doing videos for that guy with the glasses, what are you gonna do now? At the minute, well, I'm going to sort of focus on sort of like the full-time job I've got at the minute. I'm still, like I said, I'm still going to be going to conventions. I'm going to Alcon in um, September. I'm going to MAGFest in January. Uh, I'm always up for uh, cameos and appearances because, you know, even though I'm not with the site anymore, I'm still friends with all these people. It's just that, you know, the friendships don't end just because you move on. And I've not left under a cloud. I've not left in sort of any sort of negative way. And I might even go back to doing videos. That's the thing. It's just that... That, at this point, I'm so sort of burnt out and need to sort of like a, sort of re sort of decide where I want to go and what I want to do. I've always seen it as a hobby. That's the that's the key thing. I've always seen it as a hobby, so I could easily start it up again and just uh, if something comes along that sort of catches my attention, because I am one of these people who I've got to throw myself into it 100. percent I cannot half ask anything. Um, I've always been like that. I've done that with every job I've ever had. Once once I start to lose interest in the job. I will either leave straight away, which is not the smart thing to do. You want to find another job before you do that. Or um, you will start looking for another job and you will go. I've done it ever since I had a paper round. It's the, the sort of thing where I love doing the paper round. And as soon as I felt that sort of, I stopped. I stopped and I let my brother do it. Um, and obviously he got paid for it. I didn't get paid for it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've got to do it. You know, got to be into it 100%. But I still intend to work with Panda because um, me and Panda still write together. Um, every time he writes a script, he'll send me the script and I'll add lines or say you know you should do this or you should do that and me and Pan have got that same sort of sense of humor which is lucky it's kind of like you have your brother um where you can just sort of play off each other and you make each other laugh which is the sort of main thing and we still do that and i still intend to film a cameo with uh, maddie buck at some point uh, the texas chainsaw which we saw at magfest just gone so i still tend to do that i still intend to be sort of a presence online I'd like to end each interview with two polar opposite questions. The first one being, what is the hardest thing, professionally or personally, you've ever had to go through, and how did you get through it? Personally, it was probably the, as I said, the um, that death of my, uh, when my dog got to be put to sleep, because it was it's this sort of irony of irony sort of thing. I, was, I, I had the persona of Welshie at the time, and I was making the trailers, and I'd made a uh, music video for that guy with the glasses. And the one of the guys off the site, on the day this happened, contacted me over Skype and said, I've got good news for you. Uh, check the site. And they put my music video on the site. So I wasn't officially a part of the site yet. So as a fan, it was like, you know, the biggest thrill. You know, you're on the site. And then my mother walks into the room and says, you know, we're going to have to put the dog to sleep today. So just like this crippling. So, and then I, I couldn't make a trailer because my computer broke so you know on this sort of thing where you're on the site and then you get told oh you're uh, you know you we're putting the dog to sleep and i can't even make a trailer to promote the fact that i've got a video on the site for the first time and i sort of honed a sort of character at this point with the trailers so that was uh that was that sort of like you know, s you know uplifting moment and then a real sort of like stab in the gut and i was just like oh you know and then you have to, and then I had to go to work and i had to work a seven and a half hour shift and then i had to see Saul. Which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I'll never forget that sort of day. Um, I got through it just because of, you know, again, my real sort of life there with, with, with family and, and friends. They got me through that. They really got me through that. And that was a very, very tough um, 
not just day, but a, 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 quite a, a few pretty hard days there. And um, they got me through it. They got me through it. And that's the sort of thing where having that sort of physical contact where people helps you, know, you, they hug you and they sort of let you know it's okay and they'll let, sit with you and let you talk, which you don't really get online. You wouldn't really get, you know, you get people typing or voicing with you and you hear their voice, but sometimes you need physical contact. Sometimes you need someone to just sort of like sit with you and put their arms around you and tell you it's going to be okay. And that's what got me through it. And finally, what is the one thing, again, professionally or personally, you are the most proud of that you've ever done? At the minute, the uh, it's got to be dark side of the internet because when I decided I was going to sort of step aside, I'd already been asked to do it. And I sort of made that sort of promise to myself. I'm never really happy with anything I do, but I made that promise to myself that I was going to throw everything I had into it. And I remember when uh, Holly and Rob uh, came to me and said about it, and the first thing I told them both was, I can't make it funny because I wanted to really sort of show. And I, I, I knew it was gonna get uh, dark I knew, because, because of the subject matter I was gonna go into. But the feedback I got from it was probably the most gratifying because I, I, I had a lot of, I knew I was gonna get polarizing feedback from it, but I had people coming back saying that it spoke to them in certain ways and that was gratifying to be able to be, to be told that I'd spoken to them. And my thinking behind the whole thing was if one person, if one person can watch this, and it makes them stop and think about their actions. And somebody did write to me about that, and that, that was gratifying. I just like, you know, it was worth it if one person, you know, looked at that and thought, huh, just that. You know, they didn't have to think anything else, but that they stopped and thought. And that was, that was what I got from it. Wonderful. This was a Shut Up and Talk, and my guest tonight was Matt Williams. Thank you so much. This is where we uh, look at each other and we act like we're talking. You know, we're just saying things we to each other. Do this. Yes, yes, okay. we just leave so the uh, lights have gone down. Now yeah, and, yeah, uh, and you know they're gonna make this go blue and yeah. we're gonna be silhouetted and we're not gonna do any of that. We're just yeah. gonna look incredibly yeah. stupid, but we're just gonna be nodding and laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so how's your sex? I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs>